Last order, the clerk has given me permission to start, so we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I think everybody here, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead and sit down for a second, I'll swear you in just a second. Everybody, I think you're all here on the Hickory Tree case, right? So you all know why we're here and who I am, so I'll dispense with my own introduction and we'll go ahead and get right to that case since you're the only parties present. And now, if everybody who's going to offer me testi uh, testimony today will stand up and raise your right hand, I will swear everybody in at once. Gentlemen, any of you testifying? Do you all swear or affirm the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. And we are here on the city's motion. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Jack Morgison for the city. Uh, here on two matters before you, we're coming back to you, if, uh, just to refresh. Let's, do the, let's limit it to the first one, and then we'll let you talk on the first one. I'll give the respondent an opportunity to address your motion, and sure. then we'll, we'll come back to the second one. Yeah, not, not a problem at all. So just to catch you up and refresh, you probably uh, remember case was originally heard before you back in 2022 with regard to um, operations on the property without the proper permitting and so forth. Finding of noncompliance was made with the time to come into compliance in November of that year. Uh, order imposing fine and lien was recorded in January of 2023. And later that spring, uh, I believe in April, uh, we appeared before. Yes, sir. Do you have that order for me? Yes. I just want to have that. I would want to see that that order. While I have a copy. Claudia um, has one. The order to which I referred was uh, dated the 29th of December, 2022, signed by you, uh, I believe that's the 16th of December, but mm -hmm. then uh, certified mailed on the 29th of December, recorded uh, on January 10th of 2023. And that was the order imposing fine and lien that was arising out of the, the finding of noncompliance. And then moving forward into April, I believe it was April of last year, we came before you on a, on a motion to amend the findings of fact and order increasing the fine from the $100 a day fine, which is currently running, asking that it be increased to $250 per day. The reason for that motion was because the property had not been brought into compliance, that although the city understands there were different avenues in which the respondent could pursue compliance, one such avenue uh, would be to cease operations until such time as the uh, comprehensive plan and zoning uh, could be amended, if possible, in order to get the permits to then continue. Uh, the respondent uh, elected to pursue the changes to the comprehensive plan and zoning in order to then get ostensibly the, the permits to operate and was unsuccessful in that endeavor. We appeared before you in April and you, by your order on, at that time, I think it was dated in May, I've got a copy here. I have it. You have it. Yes, sir. Um, your order stated that uh, that you were confident that the respondent would diligently, properly advance and resolve its land use matters before the council, and a ruling uh, reserving ruling um, until such time uh, the land use matters have not been resolved with the city by August 16th. Matter be placed on the regular hearing agenda and so forth. Um, Matter has not been resolved. Uh, there is a mediation, which it, it, you'll hear, I'm sure, from, from uh, counsel for the respondent. Uh, I think a whole, an entire day was spent. I think there's a, another uh, resumption of that mediation scheduled for Monday. But I want to emphasize, uh, the mediation and the case and the, the global issues being addressed are really outside of what's before us here today, which is to say, there's no doubt that a violation was found and compliance hasn't been met. Certainly the city is receiving pressure from the community in part because of the operation of the business and the affectation to neighboring properties and so forth. And so the city is seeking to pursue respectfully but diligently on attaining compliance or at least doing everything in the city's power 
legally to achieve compliance, which is the goal and the objective of code enforcement, as you know, not to punish, but to seek compliance for the community. And so um, the, the matter has not been resolved. The business continues to operate. Now, there's really only so much that the city can do at this point to incentivize, incentivize the respondent to comply. And within the, the letter of the law, the only thing that we can do at this stage on this matter is to increase, because this is not a repeat violation on this matter, this is a first time case before your honor, is to seek to amend that fine from $100 to $250 per day. In our motion, we actually are trying to be somewhat reasonable and take a perspective view to say that if the court is, if, if your honor is inclined to grant our motion, that that fine would take effect on March 1st of this year if in fact you were willing to increase the fine prospectively, not to go back, but to go forward prospectively to help further incentivize the ceasing of the operations of the business or find alternate location for that business until such time, if ever, that the comprehensive plan can be amended and the zoning uh, amended for then permits to be applied for and, and achieved, if that's even possible. The fact that it hasn't been uh, successful suggests to the city that the, the, they need another solution. And the solution that we identify is the ceasing of the operation of the business. So that's, in short, what this motion seeks to address, is what we argued back almost a year ago. Um, I know you're going to hear from council about uh, prior communications with the city. Uh, you're going to hear about uh, uh, you know, what was said in planning by people that may or may not, were not authorized in our opinion, going back almost two years on, on this problem. But the point that we want to emphasize before you here today, Your Honor, is that at some point, very shortly after this all came about, the respondent was made aware, clearly made aware that they didn't have the proper permitting to operate. And we took the case forward in the proper procedure before you heard the case and they were found in violation and they still have not taken corrective measures. They've tried to work in other ways and that's their prerogative but ultimately, we see no other alternative but to increase this fine. So that's our, that's our position. I do have updated photographs that I can present to you through Officer House, who took the photographs, if you need to see them. Unless somebody is going to tell me that they've come into compliance, I will take everybody's word that there is still a violation out there. Okay. That, that is our position, that we, 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 we understand that um, it may be financially more advantageous to continue the operation of the business than to, than to uh, worry about the fine at the current level, but we're seeking to up that fine to further incentivize the, uh, the response to come into compliance or find alternate location. Thank you. Council. And I'll, I'll warn you ahead of time, and I don't know what you're planning on presenting, but if you're planning on presenting why you think some other board got it wrong, I have no authority over that. Uh, for the record, Brent Spain, Theory Spain, 1809 Edgewater Drive, Orlando, Florida, on behalf of Hickory Tree Industrial LLC. And I'm not here to argue a different board. The city council got anything wrong. But I am here to assert my client's rights that uh, potentially this proceeding should not have transpired due to multiple legal principles, including estoppel among several others. And since we didn't have uh, the last hearing back in, gosh, I guess it was May of 2023, it was a little hurried. I only had heard about it a few days beforehand. We had a packet at that time that got handed out, but some of this is from that packet. There are some additional documents that I think are beneficial for a complete record, so if I can approach. Uh, has council seen it? Yes, I am. And they're all public records. Everything in here is a public record. 20 tab exhibits. I, I, can only, I, I understand. I'm, excuse me. I, can, I, can only, I can understand council uh, wants to make every argument for his client. I'm anticipating that this in its entirety is irrelevant to the scope of our motion. There's no facts in dispute here. We are where we are. There's been 
multiple chances to be heard before the magistrate, the initial hearing, and then again at the hearing back in the spring of last year. And the only thing that's changed is our request to amend that order to increase the fine. That's it. And there's been, there will not be any presentation of compliance. So I think the, the issue is very narrow. In a 20-page tabu, tabulated submittal, uh, I, would, I would anticipate is going to be vastly irrelevant. Okay, so let me let me state state the objection and tell me state state it closely. Tell me if I'm stating the objection, the hearing the objection. What you mean to, to tell me that your position is that the only relevant documents for me to consider today uh, is one, unless somebody tells me the property is in compliance, is there a violation? Has my order been complied with? And if my order has not been complied with, should I increase the fine? And that, you're saying there's really the only thing relevant to that is the state of the property and the orders that I've entered in the past. That's correct, and the factors that go into the, the assessment or level of a fine in code enforcement, which, of course, in part relates to the compliance and cooperation of the respondent, as you are well advised. I understand the objection, uh, and I will, I will accept the documentation because we are, uh, we are not bound by formal rules, rules uh, of civil procedure here, uh, so I will allow it, but I am not, by allowing it, indicating that it is relevant to the proceeding or that it will weigh into my decision, but I will allow the counsel to present his case. Understood, but to just touch upon that, uh, counsel just mentioned that some of what goes into your decision making on whether to increase the fine is the efforts to which the property owner has gone to yeah, Yes, to and, and so compliance. for both of your benefits, that probably, I don't know because I haven't heard respondents' arguments yet, but the thing that at this point I know I'm interested in is why has my order not been complied with? And, and I know the last time we were here, the reason why was you were working through the city's processes. Yeah. And if I understand the situation correctly now, and I'm happy to be corrected, the city's processes have been exhausted, and now we're looking to legal processes to try to, to, try to challenge what's the, the decisions that have been made. Yeah, that's, that's partly accurate. But the, the fact is the story has been told uh, omitting facts throughout this process, including just as recently as last week and email correspondence with the city attorney, they continue to re repeat this false narrative about what has transpired in this case. And that's why I just want to walk through the binder. I'm not here to re-argue the November 9th hearing before the city commission, but I think this binder is directly re relevant to both motions before you because they're making an allegation there's $41,000 in fines when the city itself, in a written communication that's in here, it's not me making it up, said no code enforcement proceedings would be brought until the city council hearings were concluded. They didn't conclude until November 9th. They should have never brought it to you back in August of 2022. And when you walk through this binder, you'll see my client was doing everything the city asked him to do, even though the city planner who took over the case gave him legally incorrect information about what application he had to file. And the city council refused to have the second hearing on the, on the application. And as soon as our firm got hired and did a public records request, miraculously, we get an email to Joe Thacker saying, which application do you want to be heard, the first one or the second one? Well, that's weird, because when we walk through this, you'll see that they told my client in February of 2022 that you had to go under the second application you had to ask for I-3, which is legally wrong under the city's code. My client can't be I-3 because it's a five-acre minimum. It's a 2.6-acre track. And we end up going through that process, and now they're trying to utilize that delay to say, oh, we have to foreclose on $41,000, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And yes, Jack. I understand the council wishes to make arguments about their unsuccessful efforts through the city council. Again, this is a very limited. I I, I understand, matter. but you, you, we've 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 had a lot of hearings. You know, I'm going to let it in. I understand the objection. If you want to make a standing objection to the relevance stand, of it, I'll accept the standing thank objection. You, sir. All right, thank you. Yeah, and just so the record's clear, my client has a due process right. And again, the motion is not a motion just to increase the fine. I like to, it says a notice of hearing and renewed motion for an amended findings of fact and an order increasing the fine. And part of our, my presentation today is that the original findings of fact never should have been entered because the city, based on its statements to my client, 
is essentially stopped. And now they're trying to foreclose on the property. So if we walk through this, and this is some of what opposing counsel mentioned, is in the summer of 2021, and Mr. Wright can attest to it if need be, he came in and met with the city planning staff. Jesse Anderson in particular is the senior planner of the city of St. Cloud. They explained to him exactly what they wanted to do to operate a mobile crusher on the property, mobile rock crusher. Mr. Anderson indicated that that should not be a problem. The property would need to be rezoned, but he didn't see any issues because all the property surrounding it is industrial. In fact, there are two cement plants adjacent to my client's property, as well as a truck parking facility. They specifically asked Mr. Anderson if they could get started while they were going through the rezoning process, and Mr. Anderson indicated they could. Where is Co that? Code enforcement was advised of that, and we're made aware of that. Where is the statement that they can? Uh, well, I'll, I'll end up getting Mr. Wright to attest to that meeting. Is, it, is it documented? I, I have a binder full of documents. Is there is a documentation of that statement? There's not a written documentation of that statement. Mr. Wright can attest to it. Are you going through the binder or are you telling me what I'm going to be told later? I'm going through the binder. Let's go through so, the binder then. Yeah, let's I have stick to get to, to tab one okay. <laughs> because you got to know why let's, we... Let's go through the binder first and then tell me what I'm going to hear later. But if you want me to look yeah. at the binder, let's go through the binder. Well, you had to understand why we filed what's behind tab one. So Mr. Anderson indicated to my client you had to rezone to I-2 in industrial. So you can see behind tab one, my client did that in August of 2021. That's a copy of the application. If you go to tab two, this is Mr. Anderson in November 30th of 2021, informing my client of the schedule for the hearings. So you can see P and Z on 122121, city council on 11322, and city council on 12722. It's a typo in the email. So the planning commission hearing held was held on December 21st, 2021. And behind tab three, you can see the staff report. This is the staff report for the city council meeting in January, but it confirms that the planning commission recommended approval of it. The staff recommended approval. It went to city council in January of 2022. Behind tab four is a, is a summary of the minutes. So the city council approved it, 5-0 on January 13th of 2022. And then this is the first email that loops back to that conversation I mentioned about Jesse Anderson. If you go to tab five, this is an email from Aaron Sturk, who is a former, uh, well, it says transportation manager, but I knew her as a planner here with the city. And you'll see down, there's a red arrow pointing to it. This is where the city is advising my client that, hey, we're not gonna be able to hear you on January 27th. As previously indicated, we're gonna have to bump it to February 10th, and this is an email from the city staff itself. The property owner was perfectly okay with this as code enforcement does not have an open case on the property currently as they are awaiting the outcome of these hearings. So my client was willing to bump the hearing from the last week of January into February because he's been told, hey, code enforcement is gonna wait until the city council hearings run their course. Is that your estoppel argument? That's part of the estoppel argument. What, 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 how, was your, how was your client damaged by reliance upon that statement? Because in the interim, a code enforcement proceeding was actually brought before the city council meetings had run their course, and now they're but trying to foreclose the, on $40,000 in fines. Let me pause you. The justifiable reliance that I heard, and maybe I, I assumed the argument instead of the one you were making, the justifiable reliance part that I heard heard in your presentation was, well, he agreed to push the meeting back a month. Okay. So if that's the justifiable reliance, my question is, is how is your client damaged by that justifiable reliance? How is he damaged? By pushing it back a month, correct. That's, that's my question. How is he damaged? Because now there's been a code enforcement. Is, did the code enforcement case result from that month of pushback that he agreed to based on this statement? No, the statement is that code enforcement wouldn't, they're awaiting the outcome of these hearings. The hearing is a second city council right. hearing. So let me let me instead of making assumptions, let me let you tell me what are what are the grounds for estoppel that you want me to consider? Well, there are plenty. This to me, this is a textbook uh, case of they put walk out, me walk me through the elements. Yeah, they put they put out the welcome mat. You had Jesse Anderson indicated that you could 
commence the operation while it's going through the rezoning and land use process. So they did that. My client did do that. They incurred the time expense in opening the business. They have 23 employees. They pay taxes in the city. They live in the city. Half the employees do. So they have that expense. Then they go through the hearing process. They get up to where they are entitled to a second hearing. And they're told, hey, we need some, from the staff, not my client, staff, hey, we need some more time. Are you cool with that? And my client says, yeah, I'm fine. As long as there's no code enforcement proceedings, it's going to be brought. They confirm code enforcement's going to wait until these hearings are done. And so what happens between January 13th, 2022 and that email, and as you go through the rest of the binder, you will then see what happened, is the city ends up behind tab six is the news release just confirming that they had the first reading. You have behind tab seven another email from Erin Sterk from January 24th, where in the last paragraph she again taught, mentions she sat outside the first meeting, talked with the property owner and council member Trace. I heard a lot about rock crushing and concerns about code enforcement. So my client was indicating, hey, I have a concern about code enforcement becoming an issue here if this is not going to go to a second hearing when it was scheduled. We go to the next tab, tab eight. Suddenly, Veronica Miller, who was the assistant city manager at the time, who's now the, the city manager who lives in the adjoining neighborhood across the street, sends an email out to staff stating city council's receiving complaints about Randy Wright's property. I believe the current rezoning case is due to code enforcement action, which is a false statement. There was no open code enforcement case. And she goes on to talk about the second reading and everything else. And then miraculously, behind tab nine, on February 28th, 2022, we have Dag Marie Segarra, the Community Development Department Planning Manager, who ended up taking over the case from Jesse Anderson saying, you can't proceed with your application. We're not gonna have the second hearing and you must file an application for I-3. You cannot go under I-2 because what the use you've proposed is not allowed under I-2. So what does my client do? Behind tab 10, they follow Dag Marie's direction, city staff again, so more estoppel, and they, they file the I-3 application, which is behind tab 10. And it's important when they filed that. They filed it on July 20th, 2022. So before any code proceeding got to, the, got to your honor, my client is doing exactly what city staff's telling them that they have to do. And we're not gonna have the hearing, city council hearings until you do this. So they filed that application. Behind tab 11, you have the DRC comments from August 3rd, 2022. Again, before you ever heard this matter, no comments from staff across the board. And then on August 17th, behind tab 12, you have an email between Dag Marie Segarra and the code enforcement officer, Ms. Howes, because Ms. Howes asked, hey, since you're not going to be at the magistrate hearing today, and this is on the final page of that exhibit, essentially, where does it stand and how long would it take for it to get through uh, to city council? You had previously mentioned November. So that date of November is not lost on me because it ends up coming back in your order. So you go to the next page, uh, next tab, 13. Those are the minutes of this code enforcement board hearing. Again, something that my client was specifically told by the city planner staff, this would not happen until you get through the city council hearings. So it came before you. I was not retained at the time. Mr. Wright was in the hospital with a blood infection. So no one was here on behalf of the respondent. And when I read those minutes, and I understand minutes aren't a verbatim transcript, there's no indication that, hey, code enforcement had advised the property owner that we wouldn't bring this case forward while his applications are going through review, which they were still pending at that time. My client had filed two of them. One of them already gone through two public hearings. It only needed a final and second reading. And then he was told he had to file a new one. So you enter that order, hearing no evidence from my client, because he's in the hospital. Had he been there, we could have said, hey, look, um, they told us they weren't going to move forward with this. Here's an email. 
uh, had our hearing been held back in January or February when it was supposed to, city council denied it, it would have never ever been brought to you in the first place. So then you go on behind tab 14, you can just see our, our client continuing to try to apply, uh, comply with the I-3. In tab 15, that's late September 2022. And they're indicating, hey, you got till November because that's what Dag Marie had advised Ms. Howes how long it would take to get through city council. My client behind tab 15 had filed the supplemental information and then no second hearing, no first hearing ever happens on that second application. It sits dormant the entire time. And then ironically, when my firm gets hired in March of 2023 by Mr. Wright, the first thing we do is submit a public records request, which is behind tab 16 on March 28th, 2023. So we don't say who we're representing. We just want information regarding these applications. Lo and behold, within a week of that public records request being filed, or actually two weeks, an email, which is behind tab 18, is sent out by Francine Sutton to Joe Thacker saying, good afternoon, Joe. I was assigned as the new planner, pro new project planner for this request. I wanted to confirm that the applicant is submitting an updated application. What tab are you on? I'm behind tab 18. Okay, I'm in the right tab. And it's down at the bottom. There's an email from Francine Sutton. Yes. April that. 13th. So two weeks after our records request and before my firm has been provided the records we asked for, suddenly the new project planner says, what application do you want to proceed under? The, a new one or the original one, which is ironic because my client had been previously told by Dag Marie Sagara, you had to go under I-3. And then she says staff will confirm the public hearing dates. I write, and that's on same tab 18 at the top, that's when I informed Ms. Sutton that my firm is land use council and we're gonna proceed under the original application. But ironically, as soon as my client, you know, this records request is submitted and suddenly there's inquiries about what's going on with this application, behind tab 17, unilateral notice of hearing and motion to amend the findings of fact and increase the fine, which is what brought us here back in May to which then I had just gone through, the, all those exhibits were shown to you back in May, except my public records request. And at that time you said, all right, well, where does it stand? To me, it's an unfortunate series of events, but it's not my client's doing. It's the city's failure to process the application. It should have never come before you. Let me ask a question. August has the application been processed by the city now? Yeah, but Is the property in compliance today? The property is not in compliance Why should today? I just not issue a new order today? Uh, well, if you wanted to issue a new order today, what I would suggest is that it's a new order finding the property is not in, a, not in compliance as we stand here today and that you will impose, you will give a compliance deadline and fines will then begin to accrue there. Because again, and it ties into the other motion, they're claiming my client has $41,000 in fines because the city failed to do its job and hold a hearing on an application that was pending and was complete. It's okay. We're not here on a motion for reconsideration of my order, so I'm not going to enter any relief on that. That's one you can take up on appeal, but, although but, I think that time has passed. But uh, let, me, let me start short-circuiting things. Thus far, you have not made a case in my mind for estoppel. Uh, well... In my 24 years of practice, Mr. Uh, Smith, here, and, you, and you know uh, me, but coming I mean, to code enforcement and receiving due process is not damages to your client. I do not see the damage from the justifiable reliance because uh, what's been presented to me is well, they told us that that if we'd file the application, that we wouldn't have to go to code enforcement. Well, you're going to have to file the application to get what you're looking for anyway. The application is not a harm but to that, your client. But that's not what happened. The application was pending and they said to my client, we won't bring code enforcement until the city council hearings are complete. Right. I, I, I get that that may have been said. I don't know. But what I'm saying is even if it was said, I don't see the estoppel in it. How is that not estoppel? My client sat there for eight, 18 months while the city fumbled its fingers and didn't hear the second reading on the ordinance. Had they done it in January of 2022, there would have been no code enforcement hearing before you. But there would not have been a single $100. I, I, I asked. So I, I asked, yeah. or, or I'm trying to figure out 
what did your client do in reliance upon the statement that caused him harm? My client continued to operate on the property and employ people and incur expenses in reliance on that. And if counsel can stop the sidebar. Jack. I've had counsel unilaterally set hearings, not, not clear dates on my calendar, which got it to this date, which I find completely unacceptable. And I find it unacceptable for a municipal government in Florida to say, we're not gonna bring code enforcement proceedings against you until this process is completed. And then they went and did it. And now they're standing before you today saying, we want to increase the fine. And we also want to foreclose on the $40,000 of phantom fines that accrued because we didn't do our job and hold the hearing. That's a stopple to me. They, they put them on the welcome mat and they pulled it out from under his feet. And when you look through the documents, the next documents, they asked for us to include additional property in the rezoning. That's behind tab 19. And then they gave us four days in which to do it. If you look at the last page of tab 19, you'll see an email from me, June 20th, 2023, saying, is the matter to go before city council on August 10th, 2023, and then again on September 14th. I did not get a response from Ms. Segarra until f August 11th, then giving me new dates. And this is the harm, especially when it comes to your next motion, is now it's been pushed out even further than where we thought the hearing was gonna be. And then she asked us to add property to the rezoning and land use request that my client doesn't own and gave us four days to get the authorization. We then say, we'll bring that property in, but we need more time. So it pushes the hearing out till October and November. That's another $3,000, $6,000 in accrued fines on my client, simply for doing what the city asked them to do by amending the application. Then you go to tab 20, that just shows there was the hearing on November 9th. Tab 21, just my presentation. I'm not re-arguing that. And then just to negate any suggestion that somehow we're dragging our feet and delaying anything, tab 22 is our special magistrate request, chapter 70 request, which I know you're familiar with that process. We filed it one day after getting the denial letter. So the denial letter was on November 27th, 2023. So that's really when the city council's decision was rendered, it was on November 27th. So if you go back to this, the representation to my client way back in February of 2022, and they said, we won't bring code proceedings until the city council hearings run their course. They ran their course on November 27th, 2023. And again, you're saying there's not a motion for rehearing before you, but their motion is for you to, uh, to enter amended findings of fact and the like. And I'd sit there and say, look, one of those facts you should amend is the fact that the city staff told them none of these proceedings will take place until the city council hearings have completed. And they completed in November of 2023. That's when they completed. They did not complete in August of 2022 when you heard this matter. So to now sit here and say, well, you got to increase the fine because they've just been. So now that the city, now that the city proceedings are complete, why is your client not come into compliance? Well, our, our client's not come into compliance just yet because one, it's not as simple as just flipping a switch and then you're done, which the city is well aware of. Um, it's also because we're right in the middle of a mediation process, which I find highly specious because again, Behind tab 23 is Ms. Sutphin's mediation engagement letter, which said, which is December 22nd, saying mediation is going to be on January 31st, 2024, <laughs> right after that gets filed. So again, it's another instance of where my client exercises some right that then suddenly these motions get filed. So they unilaterally set a hearing for January 17th to increase the fine because Apparently, to me, it looks like because we exercise our right to invoke the magistrate process, we didn't go off and sue the city. We think the case can easily be settled. So we took the easier path to try to facilitate that outside of a public hearing process to go to mediation. They then, the assistant city attorney, then after I point out, you unilaterally set this and dropped it in the mail to me instead of emailing it to me, says, well, they'll reset it. So then they don't just reset that motion, which 
again, they were going to set the motion on January 17th with mediation pending on January 31st. Instead of just resetting that first motion, they up the ante and say, okay, well, we're going to move to foreclose on the lien at $41,000 of fines that have accrued, which to me, again, falls back into the estoppel argument because those fines shouldn't have started accruing until the earliest at November 27th when the city council ultimately denied the application. And then behind tab 26, you've got Ms. Sutphin suggesting that this proceeding today not happen because we have mediation on March 4th, city refused. And then the last few tabs just go to the suggestion that somehow you have to increase the fine from $100 to $250 a day because it's having such a detrimental impact on the surrounding neighbors. Behind 27 is the City of St. Cloud vendor information profile. My client is an approved vendor for the City of St. Cloud. And when you, you go through that exhibit, the second page, that's a City of St. Cloud truck picking up materials on October 11th, 2023. You also have the next picture is Osceola County. The next picture is Osceola County School Board. That demonstrates that our client's not as some life safety risk and harm that has to go to the maximum fine available. We've been providing a valuable public service. You can see the hauling tickets are in here for City of St. Cloud. The road base for the road right outside here is from my client's facility. So it's not a situation where there's a life safety But it is hazard. a situation where there's no urgency in complying with the order I entered. Well, because we had the application pending and we were told, hey, run through the process. You we know, here's, I'm going to take some issue with that because you may have been told, I, I don't know yet and I haven't heard the testimony. You may have been told by a staff member, well, we'll hold off on code enforcement. Well, once code enforcement started, you knew that you were going to code enforcement. And once an order was entered, it was pretty much ignored. And I was lenient the last time you were here and I allowed more time for that city process to run its course. And now it's run its course. And when I asked the question, well, why hasn't my order been complied with now? The response I get, well, it's not that easy. But you knew back when I was lenient almost a year ago that I was giving you time to complete that process. And if it didn't complete in your favor, I was going to expect my order to be complied yeah, with. Yeah, which the project... And now I'm hearing, well, you shouldn't have entered the order in the first place. Well, it's not that you're hearing testimony. It's in writing from the city. I, that, I asked you that part. That's the one part that was apparently not in writing. No, no, no. The... the the part that they would not hold code enforcement hearings. I do not. I do not believe that being told, "Hey, we need to push back. We need to push back your application." So, but we won't take you to code enforcement. I don't believe there's justifiable reliance there. I think the point that we got to earlier that that where I say, "Okay, maybe there's justifiable reliance on that," is keep doing what you're doing, and that's why I say I haven't heard that testimony yet. But that's the one part that's not in writing. The one thing that I that I'm not saying get you to estoppel, but I don't think what you've given me so far does. Well, I, I think when a city makes a statement that we will not take this action until the city council hearings are completed, and the only reason the city council hearings didn't get completed is because of the city itself, not my client. My client can't do a notice of hearing for the city council. The clerk has to put it on the agenda. They have to mail the notice. The and last time we were here, it. I allowed leniency. That's exactly why I allowed leniency for that process to complete. And, and now I understand. It's and and I, yes, it is complete. And that's where I'm saying when it comes to the point of the fines, there's no, their argument is you need to increase the fine to give them more incentive to stop. We haven't not stopped. We wouldn't have stopped when we have a pending application that if it got they're approved. They're ignoring my order. They're not ignoring your order in the sense that they're going through the process. Every other jurisdiction I've worked with, Your Honor, if I were in Orange County and I went to Code Enforcement Board and they said, okay, what, what does Mr. Spain need to do to bring this property into compliance? He needs to ask for a special exception. Okay. As soon as they know that special a exception application is pending or the variance application, let's say I built a fence in the side setback without permission. Hey, you need to get a variance for that. The moment I file that application for that and it's pending and I'm going through the process, they don't bring you back into code enforcement and start levying fines on you. They say, okay, he's in the pipeline. He's moving through the pipeline. My client did that. There's, it's undisputed. He did it before there was even code enforcement. But you're also telling me today, we're not going to comply with your order. No, I'm actually not saying that. I'm saying that it's not as easy as city council. You haven't told me you're going to comply with it. 
I will tell you it will probably take three to six months to comply. Because I'll they don't want to comply. That's not actually true. They, what they, they want to explore all their avenues. And I don't begrudge them that. But let's no. be, uh, look, all, all three of us have done this for a very long time. We all know how these things work. Here's the thing, and it was mentioned outside of mediation, so it's not something that's confidential. Mm -hmm. The mobile crusher, which is all part of their reliance because stuff is, you know, um, stationed and set up and mobilized to the site. The mobile crusher itself, just to take it apart, takes over two weeks. Just to take it apart. That's not how much time does it turn take to turn it off? Well, that, that's not what they've said. It's just stop running it. So then it's... So what did you, I say, though, is the important thing? To what either, did I order to you occur? You ordered either bring the property fully in compliance or you're going to get fined. So the fully in compliance from your order is a BTR, a use certificate, and some building permits. So or in, to cease operation. Yeah. And I'm trying to explain is so the reliance that goes with the estoppel the Reliance is mobilizing onto the site. It's set up. It's an established business now, one that the city itself uses and is on their vendor list. And they used after your code order was entered. So the irony is not lost on me that they just used it in October, a week before the city council meeting. But you ask me why they can't just comply tomorrow, because they'll, they'll continue. They won't get the notice of compliance, the affidavit of compliance, because if they turn the machine off today, it would take over two weeks to take it apart, then they need to move the machine. Then they have the materials on the property, which under the highway business uh, designation, they can't have. But if they, if they turn take, off the crusher, they have stopped operating business. Uh, but they're, they're still in violation because they have the material piles there. Could they be moving towards compliance? They would be potentially moving towards compliance. The material piles will take probably and Until the upwards. machine gets turned off, they're not moving towards compliance. Yeah. Well, the material piles will be there at least three months or more. How long does it take to turn the machine off and cease rock crushing operations? Uh, turn the machine off, they could probably do it tomorrow. Are they going to do that? I'm not the operator. I have to talk to the operator about it. But my point is the fact, and it's these motions are interrelated. And in fact, I think the second one was filed just because of our objection to the first unilateral motion. It To me, it's egregious to file a motion when mediation is pending and they know mediation is pending, and then to sit there and threaten to foreclose on the property over fines that have accrued to $40,000 because they never had the hearing. If they had the hearing in February 2022 and they told my client, hey, sorry, you can't do it, my client would have said, all right, well, we probably need you know, 90 to 120 days to relocate, and I think at that time the city would have said, that's fine. Instead, we're to this situation, which I actually don't enjoy. I don't like that my client's spending this money here today rather than spending on March 4th at mediation. But to sit here and suggest that my client has thumbed his nose at anybody or the city, I think is a little misplaced because we've been doing exactly what the city's asked us to do. File this application, not that one. Add this property into it, okay, fine. Move the hearing date, fine. All the while costing us $100 a day. Well, theoretically, you haven't had to pay that fine yet. Um, so. Before I start talking, and I'm not cutting anybody off, you'll both be, but have you gotten through the bulk of it, Brent? Yeah, that's, I mean, to me, that's the bulk of it. It's, look, I, I can't sit here today and tell you, no, the city hearing process is at its conclusion. We exercise one of our legal remedies to move forward. And you have the right, and that's what I said the last time too. You have the right, to, and they have the right to continue operation at the risk of, incur, of incurring fine, you know, while uh, things work, run their course. Understood. Um, I'm just asking for you, your honor to sit there and take this factual background into consideration because they've asked you for an amended order in findings fact to sit there and say, hey, having heard all that and understanding that these folks were actually moving forward in good faith trying to navigate the city's process and Bogus roadblocks were put up in my mind because the I-3 can't even go on the property as it sat in the application that I'm going to take that into consideration when I sit here and say, okay, when should have the property truly been in compliance? Now it's not in compliance. I understand that. And say, okay, well, now do I give them an outside compliance date 
to try to bring it into compliance moving forward now that the city council process is done. Yeah, and I can even, I'll wrap up my thing on the foreclosure thing if you want to. No, 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 I want to deal with that separately. All right. Um, That's really all I have because it's, it's much more than just a. So this statement, let me do a little bit of prep work in case, in case we need some time. This statement from an employee of the city that if, that we won't, there won't be any code enforcement proceedings or, or you can, you can continue operations while you're moving through this process. That's the one that I'm curious about, and I think you're going to present testimony to me to that effect. Who is this employee? Uh, it's Randy Wright, the Is that principal. a current employee or a... No, no, no. Who is the employee that made the statement? Jesse Anderson. Is that an employee? It's the senior planner. He's no longer with the city. Okay. Present, your, present your testimony to me. Is this something you represented in the past? Or is this... It's something he represented in his argument. And while we're getting there, and with that, that point, again, you, you both have known me for a long time now, and you, you know that I have zero patience for gamesmanship, and, and I would not accuse either of you of gamesmanship, and, and I'm sorry that either of you feel like there is. Um, but I would ask for all proceedings, if it's a hearing that involves me, that everybody conduct themselves with the utmost professionalism, which you have both always done in front of me, when I'm not in the room, when I'm not looking, I would expect the same thing. And the first thing, and part of the reason I'm saying this is I hear what Brent is saying, but I also understand city council for the city's frustration too in receiving a 29 page binder or 29 tab binder that council is not pro provided ahead of time. That's common courtesy too. So I would ask that to the extent that any of you have creditable beefs with each other, Let's fix them when you're in, in proceedings with me, please. Sorry, Brent, go ahead. That's fine. I would just state that the binder got finished this morning. Otherwise, I would have, I've been out of state for the last five days, which council also knew. Uh, Mr. Manzaris knew that. I've been in Michigan. I flew back at midnight on Monday. Uh, up here. I'm a little confused. I'll ask you a question. I'm sorry, the confusion? I thought you'd asked him about <clears throat> them not giving us code enforcement fines while we're going through this process. That is in writing, correct? Yeah, that, that's our suggestion. The it was in master. writing. Tell me where to look for it. The statement that Mr. Wright is alluding to is behind tab five, and that is the statement that Code enforcement does not have an open case on the property currently as they are awaiting the outcome of these hearings. I'm looking for the statement where the respondent was told that they can continue operations during the okay. proceedings before the city council or the, the planning, the, the zoning related proceedings. Yes, sir. That, that was a verbal that was given to me and Mr. Carmelo. And I think it was his daughter or his other son that was there when we went down and asked him. I originally thought the pro project was zoned industrial like all the other property around it. But it was not. It was highway business because at one time we thought about putting our office there. I retired in 22. Don't need an office. And, you know, now we, we have to find out that it was owned highway business. He wanted to put a crusher in there. So we went to the city of St. Cloud. Jesse Anderson is the man that came out from behind the doors to talk to us about it. Told him what we were doing. He's the one that actually showed us that it was owned highway business. It has to be changed to industrial. Okay, well, what does that process involve? He told us what we had to do and how to go through all of it. And I said, well, this is a mobile crusher. The man has actually purchased it because the place he was going to put it at got sold out from underneath him. He was looking for another place. I'd like to lease him my place. Is he able to start this mobile crusher while we're going through the process? He says, yeah, it'll be no problem because everything around you contiguously is already industrial. What is this person's, or what was this person's position with the city? I believe he was a planner. You believe, or you know? I don't know exactly what is. What when is he the, made that statement, did you have any reason to believe that that he had the authority to give you that permission? Yes, absolutely, I did. What what the, gave you that impression? Because he was the man that came out and told us what all we need to do and how we need to have it. They, he was. Did the you man. ask him his position? I probably did, and he probably told me, but 
I'm sorry, my memory's not that that well. That's okay. I, I don't expect to have and I don't mean to challenge you by these questions. These no, no, are just no. questions that that help me in my processing I, of the arguments. I'm not offended. Arguments. My wife does it all the time. So. <laughs> um, was there anything else in that conversation that you'd like me to know about, or any subsequent conversations you'd like me to know about? I had a whole lot more faith in the city on that day. Because he made it, it was sound. Oh, this is so simple. There's nothing to this process. And and it wasn't at the first reading. The first reading, like we said, it was five to. Oh. When when this conversation with I'm sorry, what was his name again? Jesse Anderson. With Mr. Anderson, uh, occurred. Where was the mobile crusher located at that point? I, I think it was somewhere in Orlando or. A popka was not on site. Correct, was not on site. Okay, I think he, he's answered my questions, Brent. If you have any questions for him, you're welcome I, to ask him. I do have one other thing too, because he did ask about okay. the crusher, and we mentioned him as exactly like the same crusher that the city of Saint Cloud brings in, and, and does their mobile crushing, and takes it back out. Okay. Any questions? I, I don't have any questions. Any for cross him. and. No, no, no cross for Mr. Wright. Okay. No Mr. Wright. I, do, I, I would like to make some brief comments in reply. Is it? Re, okay. Unless there's other witnesses to come forward, which I. Yeah, anybody else, Brent? No. no. Okay, go ahead. Just, just to sum response. up, I, Your Honor, and I know you probably have anticipated my, my thoughts on this. This is a case of seeking forgiveness instead of getting permission on the front end. That's really what this boils down to. We've, the arguments made by the respondent and counsel are obviously uh, zealous and it's, it's understandable, you know, that there's a good faith dispute on some of this, but the fact of the matter is the respondent moved ahead without getting the permits, without getting the authorization, and once it was brought to the respondent's attention and or through counsel, there was a failure to come into compliance, cease operation. They elected to pursue one avenue for compliance, one equivocal outcome type remedy, which would be to, to amend the comprehensive plan and the zoning, as opposed to ceasing operation until such time as permission prospectively could be given. And so here we are a year and a half after you initially heard this case. And that goes towards the compliance, frankly, the compliance, the fact that this is a for-profit operation and the economic relevance of that was the sole request in our motion to amend was to simply increase the fine, not to change any other fact. There's no dispute about the compliance, properties and non-compliance. It's within your discretion. We understand that. We'll abide by your decision, of course. But as to the estoppel and the reliance, uh, that there's been uh, hearsay presented to you. There's no written documentation of anything that was potentially relied upon. And there's been always been another path to compliance from the inception of this entire operation, which was to get approval in advance or to stop, cease operation or to not start operation until such time is authorized. And that has been ignored, not a mistake, there was no appeal to the code enforcement orders, either of them, your, your initial order or your order imposing a fine and lien. No appeal of any of those matters. And to my knowledge, no appeal of the council's actions last fall denying the requests. Nothing. And so, again, the city is seeking compliance. That's the sole motivation. And how we get there, we don't, we don't know. It's not within the city's purview other than to move through the systems that are before us. And that's why we're here. Okay. Brent, can I get you back up? I have a couple questions for you, just so I understand. So you, y'all, y'all have a Chapter 70 here, or Chapter 70. Y'all are in Chapter 70 process, right? Yeah, we're in the Chapter 70, which you know, realize tolls our time to actually appeal the City Council decision. So yeah. we weren't under a 30-day deadline once we filed the Chapter 70. And I, do, I, I obviously I'm not asking you to disclose work product or anything like that. So feel free if I ask a question that you can't give me a full answer to, I'm, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I, I assume though that the that if that's where you are, 
that you are moving towards saying that you, you have that this decision by the city and not allowing this to occur is damaging your client? Uh, my professional opinion is that the mediation should actually be successful. But if it's not, I mean, that is, that is where the process goes. And I expect yeah, that if you started the process, that, that that's, where, that's where you at yeah. least could go. I could go there. I've got four different staff reports from two different planners saying it complies with the code. So, yes, I could go there. Whether we go there or not, I, I don't know. And so to the... Uh, and I, I don't I don't know that this conversation even factors into my ultimate decision, but I feel compelled to for one to understand, but two to make sure to try to get everybody else to understand what everybody else is arguing and where they're coming from, since I kind of have to make sense of everybody's positions up here. You know, if let's say I were to increase the fine one hundred and fifty dollars a day, and let's say if that it is to a certain extent a business decision to keep that crusher running in spite of my order, but that extra $150 does the trick, and now they shut down businesses, or now they shut down business, well, you just add that to your damages. Am I wrong? Well, I don't know that a cert proceeding allows us to seek damages, so. It, but we, we're not talking cert, we're not talking appeal to me, we're talking to chapter 70. Well, the chapter 70 is not, it's not a Bird Harris Act. It's okay. just the Special Magistrate Act. But so. I assume you're moving towards Bert Harris. That was kind of what I was alluding to earlier. I assume that that's at least a possibility. No, uh, I mean, I'll tell you honestly, we have not looked okay. at Bert Harris. Like I said, I didn't want to, I, and I didn't want to make you put you in a position where you had to say more than you knew or than, than you felt comfortable saying in the public. But No, in fact, we specifically chose the, ch okay. the Chapter 70.51 process to not, increase the any adversarial nature and say hey let's go to a process that pulls everybody into mediation first so then it might not be where you're going and i'm saying this i think a little bit for the city's benefit but also to, to indicate to both of you where where my thought process is so you can kind of understand how i rule when i rule or why i rule how i rule when i, when I rule um so if respondent were to do what the city is encouraging and what, frankly, I would encourage any respondent in any code enforcement case to do, comply with the order that you've been issued by that magistrate or board. The point I'm making is that if this is ends up in a Burt J. Harris or similar lawsuit, that, you know, that time that it was shut down, if shut down over a wrongful denial of an application, the plaintiff in that case would just add that to their damages. I just want to make sure that everybody, I mean, I don't, I, I can't tell you guys how to do your jobs, and I don't mean to. I, I'm not trying to throw myself into that, but these are the things that I think about up here, so I'm kind of just really thinking out loud, maybe. And, and I understand that that's a possibility. There are other claims that could obviously be brought in light of the facts that we've uncovered uh, through public records requests and the location of where certain folks live and the like. But the fact is, is going down that route doesn't change the adverse result for the 23 folks that suddenly don't have a job. Jobs. So, and again, it's a facility that is, in fact, the city transporter who was there on October said, I'm so glad you're finally on the city's approved vendor list. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a series of unfortunate events, I guess. Yes, is what and nothing, nothing more. I mean, yeah. it's, yes, it's unfortunate. Yes, it's ironic, but it really doesn't weigh into my decision making. Um, I am still not persuaded by the estoppel argument. It's a mobile crusher. It was driven onto the site and turned on when permission was given. And I understand there are jobs, that, but nobody has told me people were hired Nobody has told me that all of these things were done because the city said if you that you can you can operate while we're going through this process. As soon as a notice of violation was issued, respondent was aware that for whatever reason, right or wrong, I now have a code enforcement case. And from that point forward, two years now, I think around about since that notice of violation, operations have continued. When I entered an order, 
operations have continued. When we were here last, last April, and I said, I'm, 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 I'm gonna, not going to do anything with this motion because I, I would like for them to have the opportunity to see how that process played out. When that process did not play out the way that, that respondent hoped, there still has been no movement to comply with my order. And so I, I think as Brent, you surmised, and I, I think I mentioned it too, but I, I think you came in expecting me to be there from one of your early statements. Yeah. The, the, respondent, the, the respondent showing an intent or desire to comply with what I've asked is one of the main factors in, you know, how much of a fine do I ultimately impose? And there is no urgency in complying with my order. And I understand there are a lot of moving pieces, and I don't begrudge anybody their decisions, city side or respondent side. But the reality is, is this is a business decision being made. So again, I'm going to try. When is, when is your mediation? It's March 4th. Which and you told, me, you told me how much time at, at a minimum would be, would be needed to I'm not going to ask the, I get the switch in the truck off. How much time to actually come into compliance to, sh to cease operation, to cease the running of the, of the grinder, and then to start moving towards no more business activity on that site? I think you said it at, at, at three to six? Yes. We, I mean, I think a conservative estimate is 90 to 120 days. Uh, three to six. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, because council is providing that information, uh, Attorney Manzaris is the participant in the mediation, but he and I had had the conversation that during the proceedings, the, he was advised it would be a two-week time frame to shut down. Two weeks, not, not 120 days. Well, and, 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 and there's layers to this conversation. That's kind of why, why I'm speaking of it the way that I am, because it's one thing to turn the truck off, and it's another thing to clean the side up, and it's, it's, there's a lot that goes into it, and I, I don't doubt that. And we, and we disclose that. That's the two weeks to break down the crusher. You still have to move it off-site. You have all the materials. You have to then truck out. You're not going to suddenly bring in trucks to haul them out one day, they're, they're going out over time. That's where it's the 90 to 120 days. The two weeks he's referring to, I mentioned earlier in this hearing, that was mentioned as to how long does it take to actually, I can't go into the discussions, the mediation. So yeah. it, there was more of a discussion of if you were to move that crusher, let's say to a hypothetical site somewhere else in St. Cloud, it would take two weeks to break that machine down so that then it could be moved and then it would take another two weeks to put it back together on that other site that's not taking into account everything else on the site uh, that would need to be removed in order to bring the property into compliance so that's the 90 to 120 days if the mediation is not successful in march and i'm not asking you for your court strategy or anything else, are there any other avenues within the city itself that you intend to pursue? Or is that mediation your last internal to the city avenue for relief? To your knowledge at this point, and obviously you can't be held to this, but and if it's more than, than you feel like comfortable disclosing, by all means, tell me so. Um, I, just shooting off the top of my mind, there, there's the potential to do a different avenue if the city allows us to do it. When they sent the denial letter, they included the boilerplate language that, that which you're familiar with we don't it, we're not going to consider any other applications for the property for blah 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 unless you meet these criteria so that potentially could be a avenue short of litigating the november decision if mediation is unsuccessful to sit there and say hey if we were to come back with a different proposal would you guys consider it sooner than the whatever their time bar is in the city because the reality is this nobody's looking at that property for highway business it's been for sale for more than two years it's boxed in with two cement plants you're not opening a convenience store there it's not happening so yes there's probably that's the one other avenue with the city is a different development proposal anything else either of you want me to hear i'm ready to rule no, no. Oh, yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. 
Given everything that I've heard today, I am going to grant in part the city's motion. But for the start date for the increased fines, and I am going to make them $250 a day, and my reason for going $250 a day is not an immediate safety hazard on that project. I, 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 the case had not been made that there was an immediate safety hazard out there anyway, I don't think. But, but the city's use of that, that yeah, that, that, that's, that's hard to overcome if that had been the basis. But my reason for, for it is the lack of urgency in complying with my order. Um, but so I will order that increase, but I'm going to order it to commence not March 1st like the city has asked for, but May 1st. That gives you time for your mediation and a little bit of time extra, and it also gives time for the wind down of the operations after, I mean, you know what my order is today, you'll get a written one, but you still have the mediation, but that gives time for compliance and motion towards compliance. Um, should that mediation not be successful. And hopefully it is successful. Anything else on that motion? Mother Brian? Okay. Uh, so next one up is a motion for authorization to foreclose. And I'm, I'm going to, it's probably more for respondents benefit than, than cities. I think my discretion on this one is very narrow. I mean, typically we're looking to, was there an order imposing fines entered? Was it recorded? Was it recorded more than three months ago? And if so, the statutory basis for authorization to foreclose has been made. So respondent, just that's, you're going to have to educate me a little bit of why I have more latitude than I think I do when, when you present. Oh, no, and you're going to tell me I have exactly the latitude that I think I have. I, no, I, <laughs> I, 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 I certainly agree with your assessment of that, of that uh, uh, discretion or, or limited, uh, uh, if you will. But this is, a, this is, as you know, and I'm sure council knows for the response, it's a procedural mechanism. This would still have to go before council. This is only, a, you know, the first step would be to get your authorization. There obviously would then need to be some subsequent uh, appearance before council and council's decision to move forward if, if in fact... Council gets asked whether or not to council. spend the money on it. You yeah. have to ask me for permission to foreclose, but you have to ask them for the money. I it, get it. it so so that's, that's, that's where this is. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the only, that's the limited uh, basis of the motion. Pure and simple. It's uh, something that the city is entitled to by virtue of the structure of the statute and the facts in play. Can I add that? And just as a review, the order was entered rather recorded, excuse me, in January of 2023, so over, over a year ago. Okay. Respondent. I'm sorry. What was the... All that stays in priority. I'm not entering a new order. This was, yeah, just going forward. Okay. While response council is preparing, I, I will also indicate it really ties in just to my courtesy comments earlier. I am sure and I hope that, that uh, these proceedings are not being used as leverage in any other proceedings. That, that would disappoint me to learn that that were true. I, I will say this, even if my authority is limited and if Respondents Council cannot convince me otherwise, <laughs> If, this were, if, a, if a foreclosure complaint were to be filed, I'm certain, almost certain, Respondents Council would immediately file a motion to stay because of the, the other pending issues, arguments, and, and I, I, a judge certainly would have the authority to grant that motion, and I'd be hard-pressed to imagine a judge not granting that motion. So I, I, I don't know that there really is, if everybody's being realistic about what a judge who has full discretion to, to stop everything, I don't know what's being accomplished here. Well, I appreciate that introduction there uh, because I actually agree with some of that. I, and we've shared our views with that. And it's frustrating to me that this got set when folks knew that mediation was uh, taking place. Uh, in fact, this was served on us prior to mediation even occurring on January 31st. So 
Same reason I don't do openings at mediation because it just gets everybody off on the wrong start, wrong foot. But a couple things just so that it's in the record. One, uh, I would submit again, as I touched upon in the earlier argument, the, the fact is they're coming before you today for authorization to foreclose on a lien, which they claim is at 41,000 something dollars, which we were, would respectfully say dovetails into the estoppel argument, which I understand you didn't accept. But to me, when the a applicant is simply waiting for the local government to do what it's sort of obligated to do, I guess we could have went and filed a writ of mandamus to require them to have the hearing, to sit there and then take advantage of that to justify, well, look how high these fines are. We need to foreclose on it. And it has been utilized. It did get brought up as city council. They haven't paid their $36,000 in fines. It's like, we can't pay them until we're in compliance. Mr. Wright could walk down there with a check today. They won't take it. And everybody in this room understands that. So there's the estoppel thing. I think there's also an unclean hands uh, equitable argument on why there shouldn't be a foreclosure authorized. And as you've touched upon, I just think if the foreclosure were authorized and for some reason they did actually pursue it, although I'm fairly certain not only would there be a motion to stay, there'd probably be a counterclaim filed, but there would be great irreparable harm to my client if the foreclosure actually succeeded. And then lo and behold, my client prevails on a cert petition and says, you should have granted the rezoning. Well, now the property's gone. And property is unique in Florida, as, as we all know. But getting back to your question on whether or not you have any latitude, going to our favorite book to read, the Florida Statutes, The Cure for Insomnia, if you look at section 162.09, sub three, which is the section that talks about this, and I'm quoting, after three months from the filing of any such lien which remains unpaid, the enforcement board may authorize the local governing body attorney to foreclose on the lien or to sue to recover a money judgment for the amount of the lien plus accrued interest. It does not say that you shall or must. It says you may. And I'm asking you under these circumstances without inferring whether it's being used for leverage or not, that there's no urgency for you to grant this motion. They could have this motion come back before you in May, where you can sit there and say, hey, have they complied or is my $250 going into effect? Maybe my guy's in full compliance by May 1st. Why would there be authorization given to foreclose? Well, unless the fines were paid, that would be why. Well, yeah, but we can't pay the fine still we're in compliance. So once we're in compliance, we would obviously, Mr. Wright indicated at the city council, he would pay the fines or ask for a reduction. The, yeah, it's just, like the that. question was, is once he's in compliance, there's no reason to foreclose, assuming that the fines are paid. That was my point. Uh, understood, and I, I uh, stipulate to that. But to your threshold point of do you get the discretion, I'd say the plain language of the statute gives you that because it doesn't say you must or shall do it. It says you may do it. So I think you do have to consider the totality of the circumstances and where we are in the process. Yeah. Well, the totality of the circumstances, the, the one factor that, that weighs on me on this motion is the pending mediation. And so I'm gonna ask you guys to swap at the podium because I have a question for city. Jay gave me the microphone, I can do that if you want. Oh, either one. I prefer you there because I don't have to turn my neck. Here, sure. Um, why would I authorize foreclosure when there's a pending mediation? I know you're not going to get there yet, but why even authorize it when there's a possibility that the whole thing gets resolved in three weeks? I, I guess the, 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 the rhetorical question in a, in a sense because it could be asked why why would you not the city's entitled to it the, because it might go away the whole thing the, might be resolved sure. in three weeks. And, and then the order would become uh, redundant or, or uh, uh, irrelevant if you will or moot really moot is the, is the word but, but if I enter it if I enter it in it, a month if I could, or well of course two and months if I could respond it, it's the not case, the case goes back two years two years now and We've already gone through today over an hour a presentation 
talking about things from the response perspective about what the city has done that they've detrimentally relied upon and they're a victim and, they, and as they continue to operate their business. This is a legally appropriate uh, procedural aspect of what the city is entitled to ask for respectfully given the facts. We go back to the hearing a year and a half ago and your order not complied with. We have an order again entered in December of 2022 not complied with recorded in January of 2023 and the fine has been running since back in the fall of 2022 and then that lien was recorded in January over a year ago. So I don't think the city is, is moving at warp speed on no, this. No, and I'm not but, accusing you of moving at right. warp speed. It's just the but, timing in relation to the mediation but, that, that I'm struggling with. I understand. It's a, it's a relevant question, I understand. But it's, it's simply to move the case forward in the way that we, as we've done on numerous court enforcement cases before, Your Honor. But, so that, and so just to give you a, a little, an example, just because it's fresh in my own memory because I'm dealing with it right now, too. And yes, one of the cities I represent, they are, you know, starting to work through their backlog of old orders that haven't, you know, been foreclosed. And, and they actually, their code enforcement department did a great job. They started with like 10. Now they're down to like four that remain unpaid. One of those four that remain unpaid, when they started hearing that code enforcement was about to start asking permission to foreclose, they filed a lawsuit, you know, deck action challenging sure. the, the code enforcement board's order. Now, that probably isn't going to get very far. I won't speak to it, but it's, you know, as everybody in this room knows, the avenue to appeal a code enforcement decision is appeal, not deck action. So they, sure. and, and the deck action was filed two years after the order was entered. So they probably have a problem there. Sure. But that was midway through our process of the same process you outlined for me. We go to code enforcement board. There they have a board. And then to get permission to foreclose pursuant to the statute. And then we go to council to ask for the money to pay the lawyer. And as soon as we that lawsuit was filed, the city said, nope, we're going to stop. We're going to wait and see what happens there before we move on. Because for the same reason, and it probably that's probably why my head starts there on this motion, is I know if I'm asking a judge, judge, we want to foreclose on this property, and the defendant in the foreclosure is saying, but judge, we're the plaintiff in a deck action challenging this whole process, the judge is going to state my action. So I know you guys aren't going to go out and file before the mediation. So why would I give you permission before the mediation? Because it's part of the process, and it would ultimately, the relevance of it in part is that it would further incentivize a respondent to come into compliance. Which, which feels like to, I'm being used as, as a negotiating tactic, which is what I don't want to be. Well, that I would suggest you respectfully is not the case. This is a procedural mechanism that's available to the city, just like any other case. We've waited over a year, and we're but why? Why should I incentivize him any more than I've already done to comply with my order on the eve of a mediation? Well, the mediation is is being it was continued from a, a full day prior. Um, there's been ongoing discussions by my partner, City Attorney Manzaris, and counsel for the respondent. The city's motions here before you are well considered and they're well supported by law and fact, and they're submitted in good faith. But there's really no basis upon which to deny the motion. It's, it, it meets all of the criteria. If, if, it, if it does act as, a, as an incentive to incentivize a respondent to come into compliance, which is, again, what the city, there's the objective, compliance. If that can be achieved, and if this is a tool that will achieve that goal, then we're, we're understandably going to use it if we think it's appropriate and we think the facts and the law allow us to suggest that we uh, receive that authorization respectfully it's not it's not done to be obstinate or combative but it's legally sufficient to request is one of the issues in dispute in the mediation i i, I know the mediation is not about this but i know it's all interconnected and I probably want an answer from both of you on this question, is the code enforcement fines from either of your perspectives one of the issues that would be resolved in a successful mediation? Uh, my partner's been handling yeah. all of the negotiations. I know from my infrequent discussions on this overall matter 
that the city is looking to achieve compliance and a resolution. Well, here's why so I asked the question. In is good faith. It's not as though... Foreclosure uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really... Foreclosure does not encourage compliance. Foreclosure is when compliance has failed. Foreclosure is about collecting money. And so that's why I'm curious if, if mediation, if a successful mediation resolves the issue regarding fines, again, I feel like it's premature here now for me to authorize it when there's a pending mediation. The pending mediation being my, the only thing that's got me there. Because I do still agree that I'm limited in my reasons for saying no. You know, the, the statute says, you know, what, what I consider. Without obviously uh, getting direct authorization from the council or from Attorney Manzaris, if the matter were to resolve at the mediation, obviously this all becomes moot. Well, it might, it might not. That's my point. It well, might not become moot. If the fines aren't resolved in the mediation, there's still $41,000 or whatever I, it's run to I, that has to be paid. I, would, I cannot imagine a scenario whereby that wouldn't be incorporated into the resolution of the matter. Based I, on I my, would expect so, too. Based on my, so my point being is that if it does not, for whatever reason, resolve, this is, this is something that the city is legally entitled to request and receive. Yeah. Is the authorization. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Council for respondent. Same question. Let's start there. Does a successful mediation resolve the fines? I'll answer, answer it in one word. Yes. Without going into details, uh, it certainly is trying to put a, a nice bow on everything in one fell swoop. So, yes. And I don't have much more to say other than uh, there was a suggestion about how this is two years going and the mediation shouldn't be considered. We couldn't invoke that process, as you know, until the city council actually ruled. So the city council ruled. It's in the record. We didn't dilly dally. I didn't wait till day thirty. And, and, and I, I don't. I don't believe that. I don't believe there's been by either party. I don't think there has been dilly dallying mm -hmm. to use that scientific term. Uh, but the the only time frame that I'm particularly concerned with is three months. <laughs> it's the statutory time frame, and we're past that. Uh, so I. Whether a client, whether a respondent has drugged their feet or not, on a question of authorization to foreclose, it doesn't weigh it doesn't weigh on on, on me. Um, mm -hmm. The timing that I'm concerned about is three months, but the mediation does, and so I, I think there are some some things I can do to get us past that date. Um, I do not, as I think you've gathered, I do not accept the estoppel argument to be one that would prevent or stop me or in my own mind make me say I should not enter a motion for authorization to foreclose if the statutory elements are met. Uh, so those arguments have not prevailed upon me, but the timing of this in the mediation and the not wanting code enforcement to use be used in those proceedings as a bargaining chip does weigh on me. Uh, so why respondent should I not simply enter an order authorizing foreclosure but condition that authorization and say it doesn't occur after, until after the mediation or even just stick with my earlier date of, of May? Why should I not go ahead and enter that order now and just give time for that mediation to run its course? Well, I guess that's one, one card in your deck. It is, and I'm asking you, why shouldn't I use it? Yes. <laughs> uh, I guess because my preference would have been that, and I think it's clear, is I'd prefer not even to have had to drive out here today. And, and, and if, if I, and that's kind of where I'm at too, though, on this, is if, if I enter that order and then the mediation is not successful, they're going to make their motion again. You're going to have to drive out here again. We're going to have to spend another hour going through this again when... I, I think I've indicated what I think I'm basing my decision on, and the only hurdle that I'm struggling with today is, look, I know you're not going to use any authoriz authorization I give you until after that mediation is over, so why would I not just condition my, my, my authorization to kick in once we're past that mediation and yeah. save everybody having to come out here again? Yeah. I, I'm sure you would. I, I wanted to hear. The, I want to hear their argument. Yeah. Well, I guess my argument is you didn't hear anything from opposing counsel about why you're obligated to enter it. I, I actually tend to agree with your statement that if you deferred it today, we'd probably be out here in a few months. So why not save everybody the time, money, and effort, and enter it 
but don't make it effective till May 1st. I would ask that any deadline be consistent with the other orders so we're not chasing different deadlines. But the fact is, as you asked me a question at the start and said, do I have the authority to deny it? And I give you the statutory language that does give you the authority to deny it. doesn't mean you have to deny it. But I can't it. be arbitrary. And I'm not asking you to be arbitrary. I don't think you're being arbitrary if you say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to consider it at this point because I agree there with is you a mediation pending yeah. right there. And again, <laughs> the fact is they served it on us on January 8th with the mediation on January 31st. This was not served after the first day of mediation. So I wasn't born under a rock. And I've been doing this 24 years. It was done for leverage to get my client's attention going in that mediation, which is unfortunate. But, you know, I'll leave it in your hands. If you want to grant it subject to May 1st, you have that discretion. If you want to agree with me that the statute says May and we'll see how all the chips fall, uh, maybe my client comes into compliance, pays the fine, then there's no need for an order at all. Uh, you know, we'd accept that. Yes, sir. It just that it doesn't sound as though uh, there's any harm in entering it effective May 1st. And that's, that's what I'm going priority. to do. Thank you. Um, with the caveat that obviously if there is a successful mediation, that resolves the issue of the fines, not just a successful mediation, but one that resolves the issue of the fines, that obviously that foreclosure follows, you know, whatever agreement the parties yes. enter. Yes, sir. Um, Understood. And... But come May 1, if there's still whatever the amount is as of May 1, if there are still outstanding fines, my order will provide that they are authorized to foreclose. So if it's not resolved in the mediation or outside of the mediation or paid, that authorization will kick in. And, and, I, and I, I do accept respondents' argument that it's, it's early, I won't call it premature, but it's early. And again, it's what I keep coming back to. I know you're not going to go out and file tomorrow if I give this authorization because you have the pending mediation. And I don't want to make everybody drive out here again. And I think it would just be rehashing the same arguments if I did. And I'm, I think I'm hearing that indication from counsel on both sides. So that is my order on this one. The authorization is conditionally given, but that condition being that it does not kick in until May 1 and it is subject obviously to any resolution of the fines that may come in the mediation or outside of the mediation between the parties before May 1. Anything else from either party on these? No, sir. Thank, you. Thank you both. I appreciate your professionalism. Um, and I think, do you need a minute to wind down? I'm sorry? I do need some so okay, so let's 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 get let the court reporter get wrapped up so she can. What 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 can we help with before as you're wrapping up? So for the spellings, um, Jesse Anderson. J e s s e, Anderson A n d e r s o n. Right, right Tisha. Um, Miller M i l l e r. Mm-hmm. Dagmarie is D-A-G-M-A-R-I-E. Sagara, do you want to? S-E-G-A-R-R-A. -R -R -A. Double R? Double R. Okay. And I believe Francine Sutton, the project spelling for it? F-R-A-N-C-I-N-E, Sutton, S-U-T-T-O-N. Sounds good on my end. Yeah, and, and yeah, we're going to keep on proceeding, but feel free to pick up your equipment. You're not disruptive. Case number 2023-1564, Bertha M. Steele, Estates, Owner, Repeat Violation, Location of Violation, 1810 Kentucky Avenue, St. Cloud, Florida. Good afternoon, April Bennett, Community Compliance Officer for the City of St. Cloud. I'm presenting this case for the property located at 1810 Kentucky Avenue. At this time, I would like to enter into evidence the following items. Copy of the notice of violation sent by certified mail posted on the property and City Hall. Copy of the statement of violation and notice of hearing sent by certified mail posted on the property and City Hall. 
copy of the revised statement of violation and notice of hearing sent by certified mail posted on the property and city hall, copy of the PowerPoint presentation, affidavit of postings, evidence of mailings, the code section in violation of, a copy of the deed to the property, and a copy of the cost incurred if the magistrate finds the respondent in violation in the amount of $297.80. And they are not here. On August 21st, while on routine patrol, Supervisor Howells observed a cargo trailer without a current registration and accumulation of solid waste and high grass and weeds in an unsanitary condition at this location. Four photos were taken. Is the residence occupied? Yes. By the respondent? Um, by the owner's grandson. Okay. On August 22nd, I was asked to follow up on this case. I performed an inspection for myself and was able to observe a cargo trailer without current registration, accumulation of solid waste, high grass and weeds, and an unsanitary condition. Seven photos were taken. On August 23rd, I sent out a notice of violation by certified mail, posted the property in City Hall, did an affidavit of posting, and took one photo. On September 11th, a reinspection was performed, and I was able to verify that the property was not in compliance. There was a cargo trailer without current, a current registration tag, high grass and weeds, an accumulation of solid waste, an unsanitary condition, and nine photos were taken. On September 18th, a call was received from Tim Seal, who is the property owner's grandson, who advised that his father um, was living in the property and had recently passed. He was working on getting the property cleaned up. On September 27th, I called to speak with Tim to advise him of the upcoming reinspection. He asked for additional time, and we agreed on October 6th. On October 6th, the reinspection was performed, and I was able to verify that the grass was mowed. However, it was not enough to cure the violation. There was an accumulation, cargo trailer without current registration tag, and sanitary condition, and six photos were taken. On October 26, a reinspection was performed and the condition of the property had not changed. Eight photos were taken. On November 2nd, a reinspection was performed and the condition of the property had not changed. Nine photos were taken. On November 29th, the reinspection was performed and the cargo trailer was removed from the property, curing that violation. However, the, there was additional accumulation that was added to the yard. Four photos were taken. On December 18th, the reinspection was performed and the condition of the property had not changed. Four photos were taken.
I'm sorry, those seem to be out of, oh. I'm sorry, I went too far on the photos. Those were the ones from the 18th with the additional accumulation. On December 19th, I sent out a statement of violation and noticed a hearing by certified mail, posted the property and city hall, did an affidavit of posting and one photo was taken. On January 10th, this property was re-noticed due to a clerical error. I sent out a statement of violation and noticed a hearing by certified mail, posted the property and city hall and did an affidavit of posting. What was that, what was the date of the re-notice? The re-notice was on January 10th. On February 19th, a re-inspection was performed and the property was not in compliance. There was accumulation, high grass and weeds over a height of eight inches, abandoned vehicles, and the property is being kept in an unsanitary condition. The re-notice was just as to the notice of hearing, not as to the notice of violation, correct? Correct. It was one notice of... I just want to make sure that you... That, I just wanted to clarify that you were just re-noticing the, the issue was with the hearing, not with the original notice of violation. That's correct. I didn't have a repeat on the original um, notice of hearing, so I had to correct that and add the, um, the repeat on there. While we're talking about the repeat, which... Mm -hmm. And if it's all, then it's all. But without the order in front of me, which, which of these violations you're alleging today are repeats or, or all of them are repeats so my prior order was for accumulation of solid waste abandoned vehicle unsanitary condition and high grass and weeds correct okay. it is the city's recommendation that the respondent be found in violation of repeat violations of allowing and accu uh, allowing accumulation of solid waste and abandoned vehicle and exterior property in an unsanitary condition high grass and weeds over a height of eight inches and not corrected by the time specified. The city would recommend the respondent pay $500 a day um, from the original date of the, um, the violation was observed, which was August 21st of 23. The city would also request that the cost incurred in bringing this case before the magistrate in the amount of $274.70 to be paid within seven days of the written order by the special magistrate. And that concludes my presentation. In your request for relief, you asked for $274.70 to be paid for administrative costs. In your statement of fees in the agenda pack or in the evidence packet, you state the costs are $297.80. I'm inclined to award the one based on the actual statement of fees, which is okay. the greater amount. Is that the correct amount? Uh, let me just double check. I may have just forgot to update that. Yes, the cost incurred was the 297.80. It's my error. I didn't update it on okay. my narrative. Yeah, it happens. That's why I check. Yes. Any, have you had any communication with the respondent or the respondents, the, the resident? At the beginning, I did. Um, the, the Tim seal that I was talking to was telling me that his father had passed. He was going to work on cleaning it up. Um, I've tried to call after that, um, and he's not responded, and he doesn't have a voicemail set up on his cell phone, so I'm unable to leave a message. But I have made numerous attempts to try to reach out to him to find out where he was at, because I was going to allow even more time, but he's just not responding at this point. Well, based on the evidence testimony received, then I'll find in favor of the city, find that respondent is in repeat violation of the alleged violations, order a fine in the amount of $500 per day to be imposed for each day since August 21st, 2023, that those fines have remained in repeat, or that those violations have re remained on the subject property and order the fine to continue to run at the rate of $500 a day uh, from today forward until all of the violations are cured. We'll also enter into that order an award of $297.80 for the administrative costs incurred by the city uh, in this case. Anything else in this case? Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. The payment of the fines and of the costs in seven days. 
case number 2023-1818, Philip Jose Rios, owner, location of violation 821, Montana Avenue, St. Cloud, Florida. Good afternoon, Alex Miller, Community Compliance Officer for the City of St. Cloud. At this time, I would like to enter into evidence the following items. Copy of the courtesy notice sent by regular mail, copy of the notice of violation sent by regular mail, copy of the notice of violation sent by certified mail, Copy of the notice of violation sent by regular mail posted at the property and city hall. Copy of the statement of violation and notice of hearing sent by certified mail posted at the property and city hall. Copy of the PowerPoint presentation, affidavits of postings, evidence of mailings, copy of the code section and violation, and a copy of the deed to the property, copy of the cost incurred of the magistrate finds the respondent in violation in the amount of $230.70. The respondent is not here. On October 31st, 2023, during routine patrol, I observed that repairs and alterations had been performed to the front porch of the duplex and there was no permit on record. A courtesy notice was sent by regular mail for the owner to correct the violation within seven working days. One photo was taken. This is the property when they bought it, and this is the picture I took after. Go back. So there was no window, it was just a screen. And okay, go um, forward. They put yeah, a window and siding. On November 22nd, a reinspection was performed and verified that there was still no application of record and the property was still in violation. A notice of violation was sent by regular mail to the owner to correct the violation. On December 8th, I verified that the violation was not corrected. A notice of violation was sent by certified mail to the owner to correct the violation. On January 4th, still no compliance. And a notice of violation was sent by regular mail to the owner, posted the property in City Hall, an affidavit of posting was created, and one photo was taken of the posting. On January 25th, it was verified there was still no application on record. A statement of violation and notice of hearings was, was sent by certified mail to the owner, posted the property in City Hall, an affidavit of posting was created, and one photo of the posting was taken. On February 16, and again today, I verified there's still not an application on record and the owner has not made any attempts to contact me about the case and the property is still in violation. So you've heard nothing from the respondent? No, sir. It is the city's recommendation that the respondent be found in violation of allowing repairs and alterations to be performed prior to obtaining a permit by the time specified. And the city will recommend that the respondent be given until March 1st, 2024 to obtain a permit or a fine in the amount of $250 be assessed until compliance is met. The city will also request that the cost incur and bring it this case before the magistrate in the amount of $230.70 to be paid within seven days of the written order by the special magistrate. This concludes my presentation. Based on the evidence testimony received, find in favor of the city, find that the respondent is in violation for allowing repairs and alterations to be performed at the location without obtaining proper permits. Order the respondent to come into compliance on or before March 1st, 2024. If not brought into compliance by that date, a fine of the amount of $250 per day will run until compliance is met. Also order the respondent to pay the administrative costs incurred by the city in the amount of $230.70, which amount will be due within seven days from the date of my order. Case number 2023-1857, Kelly Stransky, owner, location of violation 320 Pennsylvania Avenue, St. Cloud, Florida. Alex Miller again with the City of St. Cloud. At this time, I would like to enter into evidence the following items. Copy of the notice of violation sent by regular mail. Copy of the notice of violation sent by certified mail, certified delivered. Copy of the statement of violation and notice of hearing sent by certified mail, posted at the property and city hall. Copy of the PowerPoint presentation, affidavit of posting, evidence of mailings. Copy of the code sections of violation, a copy of the deed to the property, in a copy of the cost incurred if the magistrate filed the respondent in violation in the amount of $253.80 and the respondent is not here. Mm -hmm. 
On November 20th, 2023, Code Enforcement received a complaint about this property having abandoned vehicles, enclosing a front carport porch without a permit, and running an upholstered, upholstered business from this location prior to obtaining a home occupational license. On November 21st, upon arrival, I observed that several abandoned vehicles were at the property, verified that there is no permit obtained to enclose a carport or porch, and there was an unsightly condition at this location. I was not able to verify that there was a business operating at this location. 11 pictures were taken, and a notice of violation was sent by regular mail to the owner to correct the violation. Is that a flat tire? Yes, sir. That was on the street. Is there a vehicle on the subject property? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there was there was the vehicle right there um, without the, with a flat tire, and there was an expired tag, and then um, they had other vehicles in here with. That you've Sorry. answered my question. It was yes. there. There the, the the vehicle on the street is not the only vehicle no. at issue. No, sir. On December 12, a re-inspection was performed and verified that the violations were not corrected. On December 14, a notice of violation by certified mail was sent to the owner to correct the violation and three photos were taken. Sorry. So they removed the vehicle from the street to the property, but they turned it around so I couldn't verify that that was current now. On January 2nd, a re-inspection was performed and observed that the unsightly violation was corrected, but still no application on record and could not verify the vehicles were in compliance and the property was still in violation. It was also verified that the certifi certified mail was received by the property owner on December 18. I tried to contact the owner by phone and I was not able to leave a message due, due to the voicemail being full and three photos were taken. On January 12, another reinspection was performed and verified that the property had an unsightly condition again and still not application on record and the vehicles were still in violation. What's the unsightly condition as of 1-2? So they, on 2, on they corrected the unsightly condition, but before they had couches and stuff on what, my... Is there an unsightly condition today? No, no. On this one, they corrected it. Okay, so it had, that has been cured. That one. Okay. But then on January 12, when I went to do a re-inspection again, they had an unsightly condition. That's what I'm asking. What's the current, what's the current condition? Uh, right now, there's no unsightly condition. Okay, so they, 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 they cured. cured again the unsightly yes. condition. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, okay, and um, I also notified that the owner, um, I was also notified that the owner had contacted the police department and was trying to get an extension to come in compliance. Again, I, try, I tried to return the call, but was unsuccessful in contacting the owner, and five photos were taken. On January 18, after verification of no compliance, a statement of violation and notice of hearings was sent by certified mail to the owner. I posted the property in City Hall. An affidavit of posting was created and five photos were taken. On February 16, I verified that the unsightly condition again was corrected, but still permit was not obtained and the abandoned vehicles were still in violation and two photos were taken. It is the city's recommendation that the respondent be found in violation of allowing abandoned vehicles, work performed prior to obtaining a permit and allowing an asylum condition at this location and not correcting the violations by the time specified. The city will recommend that the respondent be given until March 1st, 2024 to correct all the violations or a fine in the amount of $250 be assessed until compliance is met. The city will also request that the cost current bring this case before the magistrate in the amount of $253.80 and 
be paid within seven days of the written note by the special magistrate, and this concludes my presentation. Okay, so in looking at your request for relief, what's, what's, what's an existing violation and what's a violation that has been cured but cured after the time for compliance? So all the Unsightly is cured, yes? Uh, it is, but it was um, cured after. After the date. But I, so I, I, have, I, I have to parse out this order a little bit because I, yes, I have to make the findings of fact but they're in compliance for the unsightly. Yes, sir. But then I have to give them a compliance date for the remaining. So the unsightly is the only one that's in compliance. Yes, sir. Okay. Then based on the evidence testimony presented, I will find in favor of the city, find that the respondent is in current violation for allowing abandoned vehicles allowing the construction work to be performed to close in the carport without proper permits um, and order those to be cured by March 1, 2024. If not cured by that time, I find the amount of $250 per day will run until compliance is met. We'll also find that the respondent was in violation for unsightly accumulation on the subject property. Find that that violation was cured prior to the hearing, but it was cured after the date set the notice of violation for cure. So for purposes of repeat violation in the future, I am making that finding a fact. Uh, I will order the respondent to pay the city's administrative costs in the amount of $253.80. That amount will be due within seven days from the date of my written order. Thank you. Case number 2023-1893, SLV Investments, Florida, LLC. Owner, location of violation, 1406 New York Avenue, St. Cloud, Florida. Good afternoon, April Bennett, Community Compliance Officer. I am presenting this case for the property located at 1406 New York Avenue. At this time, I would like to enter into evidence the following items. Copy of the courtesy notice sent by regular mail to the owner of record and the registered agent. Copy of the notice of violation sent by regular mail to the owner of record and registered agent. Copy of the notice of violation sent by certified mail to the owner of record and registered agent. The state copy of the statement of violation and notice of hearing sent by certified mail to the record owner of record and the registered agent. Copy of the PowerPoint presentation, affidavit of posting, evidence of mailings, code section and violation of, a copy of the deed to the property, and a copy of the cost incurred if the magistrate finds the respondent in violation in the amount of two hundred and thirty one dollars and ninety cents, and they are not here. On December 4th, after receiving a call from um, the tenant, I was able to verify that there was not an active landlord business tax receipt uh, for this location. I sent out a courtesy notice by regular mail to the owner of record and the registered agent. On December 22nd, I was able to verify that there was not an active landlord business tax receipt for this location. I sent out a notice of violation by regular mail to the owner of record and the registered agent. On January 9th, I was able to verify that there still was not an active landlord business tax receipt for this location. I sent out a notice of violation by certified mail to the owner of record and the registered agent. On January 22nd, I was able to verify that there was not an active landlord business tax receipt for this location. On February 5th, um, I was able to verify that there was still not an active landlord business tax receipt for this location. I sent out a statement of violation a notice of hearing by certified mail to the owner of record and the registered agent, posted the property and city hall, did an affidavit of posting, and took one photo. On February 19th, I was able to verify that the landlord business tax receipt was issued on February 13th, which cured the violation. It is the city's recommendation that the respondent be found in violation of allowing a landlord business tax receipt to not be obtained for this property and not corrected by the time specified. The city would also request the cost incurred in bringing this case before the magistrate in the amount of $231.90 to be paid within seven days of the written order by the special magistrate. This concludes my presentation. Uh, no, that, that is the order I'll enter. Find the respondent was in violation for not obtaining the, or not having the appropriate landlord business tax receipt prior to renting the property and order the respondent. Find that that has been brought into compliance before the hearing, but after the time set and the notice of violation for cure in order the respondent to pay the administrative costs in the amount of $231.90 due within seven days. I have a question for you just out of curiosity. So you said that the tenant complained? Yes. Why well, the tenant he, complained? that was the, a condition on his um, 
decision to renew his lease or not. He wanted to know if there were any code violations. It wasn't so much that he complained, he asked. Pretty much, yes. I was curious if there was a landlord-tenant dispute going on. That was my curiosity, but you mm, answered no. it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Case number 2024-69, Cipriano Rene Borelli and Ada Luz Borelli, owner, repeat violation, Nelsi Adeline Borelli and Samuel Cruz, owner, location of violation, 500 Pennsylvania Avenue, St. Cloud, Florida. Good afternoon, Pam Neal, City of St. Cloud Code Compliance Officer. I am presenting this case uh, this for the property located at 500 Pennsylvania Avenue. This time I would like to enter into evidence the following items. Copy of the statement of violation notice of hearing sent by certified mail to the owner and posted on the property and city hall. Copy of the PowerPoint presentation, evidence of mailing, copy of the deed to the property, copy of the code sections in violation, copy of the cost incurred if the special magistrate finds a respondent in violation in the amount of $269.23 and the respondent is not here. On January 10th, 2024, while on routine patrol, I noticed the grass and weeds were high and the pool water was not clean and sanitary at this location. On January 9th, 19th, a reinspection was performed and the property was still in violation. Um, I took three photos. It is the city's recommendation that the respondent be found in a repeat violation of allowing the grass and weeds to be over the height of eight inches and the pool water not being maintained in a clean and sanitary condition at this location and to pay a fine of $500 a day starting from January 10th, 2024, the day the violations were found until compliance is met. The city would like to also recover the cost in bringing this case before the magistrate in the amount of $269.23 to be paid within seven days of the written order of the magistrate as well. And that concludes my presentation. And my prior order was for growth over eight inches as well as unsanitary condition of pool? Yes, sir. Yes. When y'all bring repeat violations, it helps me a ton if you include the prior order in your packets so that I can verify them, just so what I'm asking so I can verify. And I verify these too when I get back to the office and make sure when I enter the new order that it does line up. But it just it's helpful to me to be able to look at that in the packet of what I ordered before because lots of times I remember them, sometimes I don't. Okay. Um, based on the evidence of testimony presented, I will find in favor of the city, find that the respondent is in repeat violation for grass and weeds over the height of eight inches. Okay and the pool not being maintained in its clean and sanitary manner. Order the respondent to pay a fine for the repeat violations in the amount of $500 per day. That fine beginning to run as of January 10th, 2024, the date the violation was first observed by community compliance officer. That fine will continue to run until compliance is met. I will also order the respondent to pay the administrative costs incurred by the city in the amount of $269.23. That amount will be due within seven days from the date of my written order. Thank you. Case number 2024-186, A. Terrell Enterprise, LLC, owner, Vida A. Terrell, registered agent, location of violation, 309 17th Street, St. Cloud, Florida. Good afternoon, Pam Neal, Community Compliance Officer. I am presenting this case for the property located at 309 17th Street. At this time, I would like to enter the evidence the following items. A copy of the statement of violation notice of hearing sent by certified mail to the owner and posted on the property and city hall. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation, evidence of mailing, a copy of the deed to the property, a copy of the code section in violation, a copy of the cost incurred if the special magistrate finds a respondent in violation in the amount of $220.96 and the respondent is not here. And not to make you nervous, but this is the one I've been looking forward to all day long because this is the one I was curious about. I want to hear the story on this one. <laughs> on January 18th, 2024, I noticed the alteration of a driveway in the right-of-way at this location with no permits being obtained, and I took two photos. And it goes all the way to 17th Street. So help me on the... Tell me what I'm looking at. Um, that's... Where's the street? Where's the driveway? 
Right there is the street. I'm sitting in the street. The driveway goes. You're all at the street, the way. and this is the driveway I'm looking at. Goes all the way to 17th Street. Where and you're on the curb of 17th Street. Yes. Okay. And next photo. So that's the driveway that's, running this way, and the street. Running yeah, that way. I took it from yeah. And so, where does the right of way actually begin? Does the right of way begin up there, where the bear, the bear, where that sidewalk looks like a sidewalk connects to the driveway? Is that all right of way? Yes. Yeah. On January 26, 2024, a statement of violation, a statement of violation and notice of hearing was sent by certified mail to the owner, and the registered agent, and posted on the property in City Hall. An affidavit of posting was completed, and I took three photos. There's some. So, see, that's a better angle right there, you see. Yeah, what's the blacktop? That's is 17th that, Street. Did they put the blacktop, or was that the blacktop is just... I think it was already there. Okay. Yeah. So the issue is their, their, their driveway as it crosses the right-of-way, and is the only issue here the permitting? They did it without a permit? Yes, but I also did get an email from Public Works, Don Callahan, and I don't think the permit... He, he The owner um, obtained the permit... But when it goes to get inspected, it's not going to pass because he didn't do it right. Yeah. So um, on February 12th. So was there was there there was there was a driveway previously? Yeah, but it didn't go all the way to the street. So he uh, added that, all of that. How did you get from driveway to street? What am I? Uh, some I, I'm missing some piece of this. This is why I was curious. This was just an interesting one to me. It was not the normal code enforcement case. So. There was a driveway before, but it didn't go out to the street. What's the purpose of a driveway if it doesn't get it out to the street? That's where I'm, and not that it, not that it's right there, here, they're there for your, for your case. It's just my curiosity. Right. Well, they're not allowed to go all the way to the street. They have to stop at a certain point. They can't go into the right of way with, um, without obtaining a permit. Without a permit, right? Right. But I have to be able to get my driveway to the street. So the prior driveway didn't go all the way to the street. Not how do, like how that. would I get a car from the? I'd have to drive across the grass. Yes. Ah, that's what I was. That's what I. That that that's the hurdle that I wasn't thinking over. I got it now. Okay. On February twelfth, I checked and there was still no permit obtained. But on February nineteenth, I checked and the permit was obtained on February sixteenth of twenty twenty four. It is city's recommendation that the respondent be found in violation of allowing the alteration of the right of way without first obtaining a permit at this location. The city would like to also recover the costs incurred in bringing this case before the special magistrate in amount of $220.96 to be paid within seven days of the written order of the magistrate as well. And not that it matters, um, but he was taken two different times in 22. Yeah, I recognize no the respondent. Okay. Yeah, I recognize the respondent. Uh, I mean, this one may have been a, a more innocent, I mean, violation. They, it, it, they may have sincerely not, it might not have occurred to them that we have to get it. I mean, he's we a, know. He's a contractor. He knows. Yeah, true. All right. Based on the evidence testimony, I will find in favor of the city that the respondent was in violation for not obtaining the permit prior to pouring the driveway across the right of way. Find the violation was cured, but cured after the time set the notice of violation for cure. So the respondent is responsible for the administrative costs incurred by the city in prosecuting this case in the amount of two hundred twenty dollars and ninety six cents. That amount will be due within within seven days of the date of my written order. Thank you. Anything else from the city today? No, sir. I do appreciate everybody's patience. I know that person was a long one, and I appreciate the lawyers. Um, I, I know it's no fun for anybody. Probably more fun for me than anybody else in the room. But just be thankful you don't have a board. Ha, ha, ha.